Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Judith, Judith Orloff, MD. Uh, Judith is the author of this book, The Power of Surrender, Let Go and Energize Your Relationships, Success and Wellbeing. She came across Judith because she wrote one of the testimonials on another book uh, that's had a profound interest on, uh, impact on my life, and that's uh, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer, if anybody's uh, heard of that book. Um, so finding somebody else who's obviously dug deep into this topic of surrender is really excited. So it's, uh, it's with great delight that I introduce you to the show, Judith. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great delight to be on your show, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. So when, uh, when, yes, when did you first become familiar with this idea of surrender? Uh, when did it start to first appear in your life? Um, well, surrender is a, a theme that occurs from the moment you're born until the moment you die. Um, because if you, if you don't surrender to this life, it's going to be a very painful, uh, tension-filled experience. But I think... I became aware of it more, you know, as a psychiatrist, I'm a psychiatrist, and um, I use intuition and empathy in my work. And so in order to be with patients and in order to treat patients, you have to surrender to the flow of the relationship and you have to surrender to where they're at and begin to intuitively tune into where they're at and not try and intellectually understand everything. because. When you surrender, you're surrendering to your whole being, not just your mind, but to your intuition, your heart. And certainly the way I listen, the way I do intuitive listening, you have to surrender the linear aspects in order to feel what's going on in, in my patients and my friends in nature and the world. And so there's a, a letting go that happens that's critical, as opposed to holding on so tight to everything you're not aware of all this in perceptual information that's coming in that you could be privy to if, if you could just shift a little bit and let go of just your attachment to the mind. Right, right. And so was this something that you were kind of all, always consciously doing as long as you can remember? No. Or, or not was it something you developed? It was more something I developed um, because I think what a lot of people find is that you know, as they go through life, if they hold on too tight and have the death grip, you know, with things, it's very painful. It's a painful if you can't let go because life is an ebb and flow. And it's like the ocean. It's like water. You have to flow with it. And if you don't, you have a very painful experience in life with a lot of suffering. And so I think more as I've become a psychiatrist, as I've developed my intuition, as I've gone on my own spiritual path. I'm a meditator. Um, the whole basis of it is letting go and feeling, you know, so much wisdom and intelligence and love in, in the universe and, and in ourselves and, and with our bodies. One of the surrenders and the power of surrender is the divinity of the body. You know, really getting out of the head, not being a disembodied head walking around, but Honoring the mind, the analytic mind, but also surrendering to what's going on in the body and listening to it, listening to your body signals, listening to your gut feelings, listening to your ahas or the light bulb moment going off. You want to listen to all those. You want to surrender to those. And it's a letting go of a linear uh, way of perceiving the world only. I'm not saying let go of your analytic mind. I, as a psychiatrist, I've gone through 14 years of medical training. And so I've had quite a bit of linear training, you know, which I value enormously. But in addition to that, it's not either or. It's in addition to that, you can surrender to other aspects of who you are. And with intuition in particular, you can't hold on to it tightly. You have to be receptive, be open to your gut feeling. If you meet somebody, if let's say you're at a meeting, and suddenly your gut is tied up in knots or you feel nauseous. You don't want to dismiss that. You want to surrender to that. You want to let go to the signals that your body sends you so that you can get all this added information about how to proceed in business, in, in love relationships, in health issues, with health issues. You want to have this information coming in, but if you hold on too tight to 
just linear thought, you won't be privy to that information. Right. And and when was it that you you first sort of developed the dis, this discipline then to let go and notice like what what was the yeah the genesis of you developing this ability? Well, I had an experience um, early on in my practice of psychiatry where I was treating a patient who had major depression, and uh, she came in. She had all the symptoms in the DSM. Um, she had insomnia. She had low self-esteem. She had um, a brain fog. She was slowed down. She didn't have good social relationships. And, and so at the time when I opened up my private practice in Los Angeles, I put her on antidepressants and you know, she got a lot better over a period of six months. And then at that point, I had this flash, this intuition that she was going to make a suicide attempt. And I didn't um, see any clinical evidence for it. I didn't even, you know, talk to my colleagues about it because I didn't think it was possible. I thought it was just a random thought. And so I didn't even pursue it with her. And within a few weeks, she overdosed on the pills that I prescribed for her and ended up in a coma in an intensive care unit in Los Angeles. And so I felt that by not surrendering to my intuition, by not listening to other forms of knowledge that came through to me as a therapist, I did her harm. And that was Mm. devastating to me. That was like a turning point for me, because I knew that as much as I valued my conventional education, I had to open up and surrender to something else in addition to it. It's in addition. It's not either or for everyone listening. You, you used both. And so right. that was really my turning point because I felt like I had harmed her because I had this idea of how to proceed that I, I wasn't deviating from. And so that was really the turning point in my life where I began, began. Surrender is not easy necessarily. You know, it's an ongoing practice that of letting go, of breathing, of, of trusting maybe a flow larger, you know, than yourself that comes in, whether it's intuition, love, the greater intelligence, or you can call it God, whatever you want. But to surrender to something larger than yourself, in addition to all of your gifts and talents. Right, right. And and I suppose, how did your colleagues react? Did you share with them that you'd had this, this intuition that she was going to do this? Not and- at first. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I I pretty much kept it to myself. But what was so interesting at that time, um, I was also um, I didn't know where to go or how to process this. So I just and I I had, you know, all my colleagues are pretty linear, think pretty much linear thinkers. Um, And so I just kind of put in a, a prayer or a wish or that I'd be shown people that I could talk to about this because I had nobody. Both my parents were physicians. I have 25 physicians in my family. and. (laughs) They weren't really open to all this at all. You know, they considered it woo woo. And, um, you know, they just didn't, it wasn't part of their mindset. And so I just happened to be walking down the street one day and I looked down, there was a magazine called LA Weekly. I looked down and I saw this man on it. And I just got waves of goosebumps of recognition for this man, though I've never met him before. And his name was Stephen Schwartz. And he ran a group called the Mobia Society, which did remote viewing. And I called Stephen um, and we immediately clicked when, you know, when you have those relationships where you meet Mm. somebody and like click, click, click. And it's like meeting an old friend and you just start up, even though you've never talked to them before. Well, Stephen became my mentor and he helped me walk through a lot of the fear I had about surrendering to my intuition and surrendering to things beyond my medical education and all the fear I had about that. And I told him what happened with my patient and he helped me to make sense of it. And so with that support, I was able to develop the practice of surrender and letting go and see the benefits of it. You see, that that's the thing. This isn't just some abstract concept. You see the benefits of it. I mean, just if you surrender in your relationships, if you're having, let's say, a conflict with with a friend or a mate or a coworker, and you take a few steps back, breathe, don't interrupt, you surrender to what they're saying, you don't want to get in there and change it or, you know, alter it in any way, you just let it play out. And then 
you say something from a very wise place, that's very different than jumping on somebody or judging them or um, you know, not surrendering to the flow of what's going on. And also, Richard, part of surrendering is in my life is that I look at everything as a teaching, as a lesson. I don't look at anybody, any person, place or thing as irrelevant to my life, even if it's um, you no know, dealing with draining people at work you know, or, or dealing with difficult people. I look at all of them as teachers. So, you know, that there's something for me to learn from that experience about how to be more centered, how to surrender more how to state my needs and set boundaries, you know, in a way that they can accept and hear. So I, I try and look at everything from that standpoint. So I don't, you know, try not to get into victim mode because that won't work if you do that. You know, so yeah. that, that helps with the surrender process for everyone listening. You know, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I would consider it because it's a, a point of view that could be really helpful to you. Right, right. And I, I suppose, interesting, your act of finding this, Stephen Schwartz, was an act of surrender, right? I'm getting goosebumps. I don't have any rational reason to go try and seek this guy out other than that I've looked at his photo and I've got goosebumps. <laughs> so right. I'm going to follow my intuition. Turns out he is a great mentor for you. So... I sort of answered my question because the question is, you know, what were the benefits that you started to see? But it sounds like you immediately got some benefits, right? Because you you followed your intuition and you found a great a great mentor. Which is such a gift to find a great mentor. And how do you know if someone's right for you in terms of being a mentor, in terms of being a, a mate, in terms of being a business partner? You get those goosebumps. You get the gut feeling that says, yes, this is the right person. Or you get the goosebumps that say, ooh, this doesn't feel good. You know, he's, he or she is talking a certain way, but something's not right. You know, where you begin to listen to that instead of, oh, this person looks so good on paper. Oh, this person has such a good, you know, uh, work history. I think they'd be great. But yet you're feeling drained around them or you're feeling nauseous or you're getting a headache or your energy is going down. That's the surrender is to. Surrender to the fact that you do have other forms of information coming in that would be ever so helpful if you listen to it and don't talk yourself out of it or second guess it. And when you could begin to learn to flow with all these perceptual avenues that are going on all the time, we're like a, you know, a great river, you know, where there's different streams and rivulets coming in and we're constantly getting input as human beings, that if you could surrender and not have a fixed mindset on, I'm going to get information this way, and I'm only going to get information this way. And then if it comes in, forget it. And that's going to limit you tremendously. And especially if you're in the creative arts, you can't function that way. You know, creativity means opening to a larger flow, the muse, you know, the universe coming through you so that you could flow in your work. And my work as a writer if I was to try and control everything, my, my writing would be dry and flat and horrible, you know, and, and, it, and academic, which I, you know, which is fine, but I don't want to you know, strictly write in an academic way. That isn't my style. And so the surrender comes in seeing your potential and every possible thing that's coming to you in terms of how you perceive life and people. You know, those, those are the possibilities for you if your mind can give you a little bit of a chance to loosen up. The mind is the rigid one that doesn't want to surrender. The ego does not want to surrender. It does not. And it would rather have you suffer than surrender. So I just want to warn everybody about that. You know, that, ego, Well, that's a profound point, right? It would rather have you suffer than surrender. Right. That's a strange thing to get your head around, right? Like, yeah. It's there's some part of me that would rather suffer than to surrender to something that might ultimately improve my life. That's an interesting sort of paradox, isn't it, of our condition that, that that's how we're set up at some level. It is, but you have to understand how you're set up. I think if you have some insight, human beings have insight into how they're set up. They have this big ego. Um, we all have an ego that I, I feel, you know, because I have a Taoist practice and that it's something to tame. It's not something to let go wild and, you know, have a field day in my life. That's not who I want to be. 
you know, and, and, and I, the ego has a lot of strength and it allows me to get out in the world and, you know, go travel around and speak in, you know, various places. It's very, it's an ally. All right. But it isn't an ally if I'm in a situation where I need to be right. And I'm not giving up my need to be right. My ego wants to be right. All right. So I'm right. It alienates 10 people, but I'm right. You know, so I'm holding on to the fact that I'm right. You know, that's not going to get me anywhere. You know, the ego is going to feel, oh, I'm right. I'm, you know, I, I need to hold on to this. But that isn't wisdom. The wisdom is, all right, I'm right. But am I going to alienate my mate because I'm right? How else could I deal with this? How can I use empathy, which is what I write a lot about? You know, how can I surrender to empathy to listen to at least listen to where this other person is coming from so that I can communicate with them? That's a surrender. But the ego always needs to be right. So it never wants to let go of that. So you, you hear people and I have a relative like this you know, who had a, a betrayal happen 30 years ago you know, with, with one of my uncles, you know, some financial embezzlement. And she was wronged. No doubt about it. She was wronged, my relative. But she's still telling that story 30 years later to everybody. And so she's held on to it for all these years, which isn't good for her. And it's not good for anybody. You, and there comes a point, you, you don't have to forgive his betrayal. But you do have to kind of get to a point where you could surrender your ego enough to kind of have mercy on the, the suffering and the, you know, the unhappiness that caused him to do all those things. It's not justifying the act at all. It's just, you know, people who are mean or deceitful, um, even narcissistic, you know, they're doing that from a wound. They're not yeah. happy people. A happy person doesn't do that. You know, it, they don't. They, they treat other human beings differently than that. You know, so at least when you can surrender at least to a, a little bit of empathy for someone, even if you don't like them, even if they've done something bad to you and you're not forgiving them necessarily, but you're loosening their grip on you so you could go on with your life. And that's the benefit of surrender is feeling that freedom. So you're not latched into all the ego, uh, all the things the ego wants to carry around. The ego wants to carry big burdens because it's able to do that. And it's never going to admit that the other person might have a point. So it's just good to know in your, in your being and to know you also have another part of you, which is your intuition and your heart and your empathy. So you have a choice of using both, of using one. It's, it's a matter of discernment in life. Surrender is a matter of discernment. What you want to use. I mean, some people I, I'm mainly in my mind with because I'm doing that, you know, I'm mainly interacting with them on that level. But, you know, with my friends and, you know, I, I choose to be more, you know, heart centered as well, you know, and because it's more fun for me. <laughs> and so, yeah. 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 But, but that makes sense that the ego would rather be right and suffer <laughs> for its righteousness than to give up, give up the righteousness, right? It's yes, to surrender. I think surrender and giving up or failing or, you know, like in war, you surrender. It's not exactly yeah. like that. That's not exactly the way I'm using the term. All right. The way I'm using the term is, is more, it's a, it's a spiritual precept. It's the, the surrender to um, something larger. It's the surrender to humility. It's the surrender to higher ideals that we want to embody, you know, each day by day. Who do you want to be? You know, we have all kinds of parts inside ourselves. We have, you know, the compassion and the hopefulness and the lovingness and the loving kindness. And we also have you know, the maniac and the serial killer and the, you know, all the, you know, we're capable because we're, we're human beings, we're programmed to do the whole thing. And our power and our surrender, our discernment is deciding where we want to come from in ourselves so that we don't allow the, the more difficult, darker aspects to come up. If the problem is when people are unconscious of who they are, they act out their darker parts without gradually healing little by little, 
you know, your desire to be right all the time. If you want to hold on to that, that's fine, but it's not, not going to really get you anywhere other than miserable. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Well, well, I guess it, it, other than miserable in the long run, it might get you because the ego is capable of accumulating you know, wealth and goods and, you know, even relationships, right? It can, it can get a lot for you. Uh, that's the other aspect of the ego, right? It's capable of doing, it's capable of bringing me rewards, external rewards. Um, and that's another reason I suppose I want to keep my ego going because I know it can get me stuff. Well, you, that's fine. The ego can get you stuff and that's wonderful. But the state of who you are when you get stuff is critical. So you want to, you know, I always, humility is, is something that's very important to me. Because, I, you know, you've seen people where the ego just is going crazy. And to me, that's not who I want to be or who I want to be around. That's not attractive to me. Just surrendering to, let's say, money, power, and those motives. I mean, just that isn't nearly enough for me. I wouldn't be satisfied, you know, with that because I crave more intimate connections than that. Um, but... You know, you can have money, power, prestige, everything, and be a humble, heart-centered person. You don't have to become an egomaniac. That's just a stereotype. And it's a trap that people fall into because they don't know how not to. Yeah, and that's what's so fascinating about the book, The Surrender Experiment, which opens with this guy, like on a private jet, like selling his company for a billion dollars or whatever it is, right? Like he has everything you've just described. And yet at no point, it seems to me, has he stepped off his spiritual path. And, and the surrender to these other qualities is not going to take away anything from you. People feel that if you kind of loosen up your grip on things and you open up to different ways of being that is not totally under your control per se. You're more allowing life to happen than directing it. You both, both, you can do both. And I want to just emphasize that to people. Um, but if you only want to control everything, that's all right. I mean, you could learn from that too, but it's very painful. You know, and especially as you age, it gets more and more painful, you know, if you do it that way, because I've treated so many heads of this and heads of that, you know, throughout the years. And, you know, when they're in their place, when they're in their power, you know, running that studio or running that company, you know, they they're they think they're happy, you know, but then as you know, they get older and they lose leave the job, you know, they're they're. Where is their meaning? Where are they? They can't get happiness in the same way. So it didn't stay with them. You want something that's enduring. You want values and ways of being that you can develop no matter what age. And it keeps going because it has these, these values, you know, the values of goodness and compassion and charity and humility. You can do all that and be, quote, successful. You know, and you can do all that and not have all that, quote, success. Yeah. You do it either way. Right. right. Something that's coming to me as you speak, which is, is this idea of surrender. As you say, it's not this, you're not thinking about it in the same way as, as we use the word in, let's say, war. As, it's almost surrender as ascension. That was the image that came to me. It's like this letting go to something even bigger. All right. It is. And feeling powerful enough within to do that, to feeling, you know, I mean, I, this has been part of my life for so long that, and I know it, it's difficult because at times, because surrender is the deepest possible practice where you can let go, trust and have faith. Now that there is something there that's going to be with you as a creative person, as a writer. I mean, that's where I, and as a meditator, that's where I, I feel it you know, very strongly, because I know I can't think my way to writing a lucid, meaningful book to people, it wouldn't work, you know, it would be dry. But if I write from my heart and my head and, and anything, I, I pray every time before I write that I be given the right words and the right way of expressing them to reach people, because that's my ultimate goal is to reach people. Um, and so, you know, that's what you know, I, I've been writing books for, you know, 20 years and that's, I've succeeded, you know, I've succeeded. <laughs> so you have and that so, success. You have that success that you describe, right? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, and I have. You've, I and have. you've surrendered, yeah. I keep trying. What what I'm saying is that you surrender sometimes, but then you take it back, and then you, you surrender. You go, oh my God, I let I'm not surrendering. As I feel so tight, I feel so angry, I feel so tense. Why do I feel if you're if you feel really tense, you probably aren't surrendering. If you could surrender simply by taking a breath, let's say you, you've taken it all back, you know, you're not surrendering. That's okay. Don't beat yourself up. That's what people do, as I know, is beat, 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 beat up in the head, you know, and they, you might not know it. You don't know what suffering people go unless you're standing in their shoes, what they go through. But I know, as a psychiatrist, what people do in their heads. And I know what I do in my head. And my, my teacher says it's, you know, progress to beat yourself up a little bit less each day. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a realistic goal. It is a realistic goal. And I hope everyone listening, you might say, oh, I don't beat myself up. But really, you know, everybody does. It's part of being human. And hopefully, though, with the surrender practice and listening to your intuition and being guided in your life, not just being guided by the linear mind and your ego, but being guided by, you know, a greater force, call it intuition, whatever vocabulary works for you. I'm not attached to any word, you know, for this larger force, but for you to feel it. So you know that you have the wind behind your back, you know, that you know that there's, you're getting some help if you could open up, but it takes humility to open up to it, you know, and, and realize, you know, you're not running the universe. You're not, you know, as disappointing as that might seem, you know, you're not, that isn't how it works. And um, surrender can only make you more relaxed, more lovable, more sexy, uh, less fear, um, and more attractive a person. Right. So, yeah. Can't hurt yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I, I thought, I'd, well, just, just relating my own experience with the surrender, because I started, um, I suppose you could say self-development as in terms of doing deep feeling therapy. Right. And that was my focus. And so it was, and so I, I didn't see it in these terms at the time. But my initial surrender, and you talk about this in, in your 10th surrender, um, harmonizing illness and pain, but my, my initial surrender was to pain, was to emotional pain, right? And, and I, I'd led, went, got, I'd gone all through my 20s and, you know, and then into my early 30s, I'm very much shut down to all my emotions, you know, addicted to alcohol and I had sexual addictions. And, and the, the first sort of chink, the first sort of opening and break of the ego was to surrender to to emotional pain. And then I suppose now, as I look back joining the dots, I find that that initial surrender to pain has now opened up over time, my ability to surrender to the body, to the sense of a higher power, to joy, to you know all of the other aspects that you mentioned in, in your book. Uh, and and so I suppose my question is, is, is that right? Can people like almost start surrendering anywhere? And then that helps them to surrender everywhere? <laughs> It's each person is different what their surrender is. You know, I mean, if the surrender is an awakening, when you surrender to your pain, I mean, you think of all the forces. Why then? You know, why did you did it just get so bad you reached a bottom? That's that's common with people. You reach this bottom of pain through a breakup, through physical pain, through loss. You reach a bottom and you think, I can't do it this way anymore. And that's where the surrender comes in. You know, that's okay. Well, what does that mean? I can't do it this way anymore. It means you have to open up to something larger and open up and open up to something beyond the pain. Because one thing about pain, if you're in physical or emotional pain, you don't want to resist it. You want to go into it and you want to melt into it. You don't want to resist it because if you resist it and you clench, it makes it worse. It, there's a difference between pain and suffering. You know, suffering is something we do to ourselves in our own minds. And when we clench, a pain is simply there's physical or emotional sensations. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such an important distinction, isn't it? And, and most of us, and that's the other aspect of the ego, right? We, we would trade uh, almost eternal suffering for any level of pain, right? Yeah. The, the, to delve into that acute pain, even if that Feeling that is is curative and helping us to open to great greater gifts in our lives. 
It, it is, but it, it requires something other than the mind. If you have pain, you can do all or, or any kind, if you're going through a physical challenge or a physical illness of some sort, um, you can do everything, all the linear possibilities, all the real world possibilities you can do. And as you're doing it, you can surrender to your intuition to, to really tune into what's best for you, what feels right for your body. You know, always the surrender question is what feels right to my body now? And to always check in with your body, you know, never just be a passive a recipient of anything. You know, you, you all, I mean, for me, I always have to tune in. What does this feel like? Does this feel right? Does this feel wrong? Does it feel premature to do, you know, what, what does it feel like? So I'm constantly having dialogues with my intuition as well as my mind is thinking, well, you know, what's the most logical approach here? So you, you, you do both, but you need to surrender to the, the sensations instead of fighting it. If you have back pain right now and you're sitting, you know, here, if you just take one breath and you just relax your muscles a little bit, that will help more than all the thinking in the world at this moment, if you're having pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And then, and then for me, it's like, then I can, I can sometimes do it, you know, what, what, like a gentle, like, why, why have I got this back pain? Like, what's going on? Where, where's this right. coming from? Like that gentle inquiry that... Uh, yeah, uh, to me, I find synonymous with like tuning into the intuition. Like, like it's almost like that quiet voice needs a quiet inquirer. <laughs> yes, and the gentle voice that you just had, Richard, was so beautiful. You know, to be gentle with ourselves instead of beating, beating. Why didn't you do this? You should have done that, and blaming yourself. I didn't do it good enough. How can I do it better? Yada yada. I mean, this is what keeps you up at three in the morning. Well, that's why people can't go back to sleep because the, the mind and the ego are just ramping up. And you know, that's where the surrender comes in. Yeah. You know, I, can't, I can't control this right now. This is a big aspect of surrender. And this is what's hard for people who love power and control, you know, to admit at this moment, this isn't a matter of my controlling anything. This is a matter of me centering myself and waiting you know, sometimes the proper action with something is to surrender to waiting or to non-action. It's not to keep pressing down that door, whether it's work or any other door. That door is not ready to open. So if you keep pushing it, it's only going to cause problems for you and a lot of pain. So the surrender is not now. I know maybe later, maybe never, but not now. And to just take a breath and, and take a few steps back because. What I've seen with my patients and so many friends is they get into trouble. They want something. The ego wants something. You know, it wants to go after something. It wants this relationship. It wants this job. It wants this. It wants that. And it just goes full force. And there's nothing wrong with that except if the door is an opening and it's not time for it to open. And that's where surrendering to intuition comes in, where you have to say, okay, it's not open. Don't panic. It's just not now. Just take a step back. Be the mountain. There's a saying, be the mountain. Let them come to you. And so you don't want to destroy relationships through your desperation of pushing too hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that that, when I think about my early, I suppose you could say, experiments in surrender through feeling emotional pain was one of the, the toughest things was it meant I couldn't be productive. Right. I had to surrender to the fact I was going to lie on a couch and cry for like four yeah. hours. Right. <laughs> and every, there's this little part of me that, oh, I put the to do list and this is what I do and how am I going to make money? And da, 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 da. He says, like, just feel the pain, just feel the pain. Right. That, that but was that's something that, the, yeah. But yeah, you beautifully describe what goes on in, your, in everyone's head at times when they're in pain. Now you can, you can feel the, hear the voices with that, but. At those times where the voices are so loud and you need something other than the voices, they're only causing you more pain. That's, you know, may I surrender? May I let go? May I feel happiness and peace? You know, and to take a breath. And that means taking the pressure off. Surrender means taking the pressure off of yourself, which isn't what a lot of us were taught to do by our parents. 
No, we were taught to increase the pressure. When things get tough, go further, push harder. And sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. That's the thing. So with surrender, you do all the footwork in your life. You know, you do everything to make your dreams come true or to make a goal happen. You do everything possible. But you can also, true success is knowing when to stop and knowing when to back off and wait for the kind of the, the cosmic winks you know, to come in or the Cosmic magic of the wings. universe. I love that. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. To help you. There's, there's magic out there that can help you. It's not just you. I mean, that's where I, I've seen people lose their power, where they think it's just them, where they're the force that's moving the universe. And that's going to really limit you because, you know, from my point of view, at least, and everyone who's listening has to determine this for themselves, it's never just you. It's you when I'm sitting with the patient. It's me, the patient, and a greater force, a creative force that's helping us because it loves healing. It loves it when we help people. It loves when people heal. It wants to come in and you know give us a you know a little help. And you want to enlist that. I'm telling you, there's a force for the good out there, but you have to surrender to it. And it's not your ego, it's something in addition to you that will co-partner with you and help things. It will help things. It will help you. It will help if you're working with someone to help your business associates. Um, you know, I just gave a talk at Google and, you know, what they were most interested in was, you know, how do I bring empathy into the workplace? You know, especially if I don't like somebody, especially if a coworker is problematic and or they're negative and my buttons are pushed what do I do then you know and how do I get along with people and surrender has so much to do with that where you can have empathy and namaste I respect the spirit within you to anybody that doesn't mean you like them it means you're surrendering the desire to like them like liking somebody is you know very personal you know, and I think it's very overrated whether you like someone or not in a certain sense, but you want to show people respect, especially in the workplace. You want, let's say you don't like a boss or you don't like a coworker. You could, namaste, you're human. You're going through all the struggles I'm going through, even though you might not show it or I don't see it. You know, you are, you're going through it. I respect the spirit within you. You know, I, I do. And that's much better than I hate that guy, you know. <laughs> I love the fact you're going out there and speaking to corporations, right? And, and bringing in this language. And, yes. I, I, and that's what's, I suppose that's what's encouraging as well is that, you know, people are, are booking you to talk about this stuff because, yeah, because, we, we, you know, there's a lot of talk right in the, in the workplace right now, you know, innovation, creativity. And, and I suppose it's often couched in terms of, you know, techniques and approaches uh, and, 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 and the environment we want to set up for a lot of this stuff to happen. Um, but there is this, you know, element that's so important to talk about is what you've just talked about is that this isn't about humans being more creative per se. It's about us allowing ourselves to open to the bigger creative force. Right. And that is a that is a really important framing. I think that's often missing in our conversations, like about, let's say it could be empathy. It could be a creativity. Yes, absolutely. And to be able to have the, the humility to accept that guidance, it, does, it just makes you more powerful in a different way. But it's a humble kind of power. It's not an egotistical kind of power. It's a, um, more the Dalai Lama kind of power, you know, that yeah. he has. Yes. Um, that you can, you can embody, you can be that hard driving executive and have this. So that, that's, I, I mean, if, if we want change in our world, we have to do something. This is not working. You, you see people, they can't get along with one another, you know, and they're just us versus them hitting, you know, heads all the time. And it's not working. You know, anybody can see that. It's just not working. It's not harmonious. And so we have to make a decision if we want to change, you know, if we want to change the world and help our planet, there are certain changes within us we have to make. And yeah. that's all positive. You know, it's all positive, but it's got to start somewhere. You know, it starts with the individual, it starts with business leaders, it starts, you know, saying, who do I want to be? What do I want my life to be? It will go by quickly if you're lucky enough to live a long time. You know, it will go by quickly and we have our chance to help things here. And I feel really passionate about this and surrendering 
Now, to the best in ourselves and taming the worst in ourselves is very important. It's very important because you have the problematic parts of the self that, that come up, you know, the, the ego or the person that doesn't want to forgive and the person who wants to hate or hold on to resentments, you know, it's, you know, you want to hold on to it, but you don't want to really, not, not if you're interested in the higher good. Yeah. If you're just interested in yourself, that's a different path. You know, but if people listening are interested in making a change here, this will create a change because it will change your perception of other people, yourself in the world. And you'll see more of us as a community, a human community and family, this us versus them phenomena, the enemy, you know, is the mind phenomena. It's not a heart phenomena. It's not empathy. It's not us coming together as humans. And if you don't want to come together, that's a different thing. But I, I feel like it's very important to come together and the changes we can make internally and teach those changes in larger settings. That's how the new education happens. And that's how change can occur. So it's I, I'm pretty, you know, altruistic about this and optimistic about it because I, I feel it's a very good direction to go. You know, and I've seen the changes in my life and my patients and in larger settings and teaching larger workshops. People change as a result of this. And we need the change right now. We, we can't afford to keep going on as we've gone on, which is basically unsurrendered. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And it's, I, I'm so interested with this idea of, of language and you use this term cosmic winks. The last podcast guest I had on the show, Satish Kumar, talked about this idea of having, you know, we've, right now we've got a human resources department, right? And so he said, well, really, that should be human relations department, which I got. But then he went on to say, uh-huh. we, what we really need is, is also not just human relations, but cosmic relations. We need a, we need a, you know, we need a director of CR, a director of cosmic relationships. <laughs> relationships. But I, you know, I just thought that was a wonderful phrasing of it. And and I suppose for me that, that that cosmic can be this sense of the supernatural, the sense of beyond, the sense of, of you know bigger connectedness, the whole you know the universe, God, whatever. But it, it it can be as simple as a higher power. And for me, as I as I just expressed to begin with, that was just me allowing myself to surrender to my these bigger emotions that would be on my email that I'll be on my email beyond my ego, um, beyond my ability to control. I just kind of let them erupt in me. Um, but that that sort of broadest sense of cosmic, as in beyond the ego, beyond ourselves, beyond us as I- individuals, is such an important message. Thank you. It's not woo woo either. It's it's gone throughout the ages, you know. And it's not anti intellectual either, you know. It's right. just ad- adding something onto it. It 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 enhances your intellect. It enhances your success. It enhances your connection to yourself and to other people. You, you want to be connected to other people. You don't want to just be in your own world necessarily, because ultimately what I think you'll find satisfying is the love and the, the uh, camaraderie that we all can have for one another. And it's not us versus them. It's impossible. That's impossible because we're all humans. We're all the same package. We're all you know made with the same organs and the same physical and emotional structure here. You know, we're so similar. Everybody on this planet is just so similar from a medical point of view and an anatomic point of view. And, you know, we're here together. And the only way you're going to know that is if you can surrender certain belief systems that, you know, in terms of superiority, inferiority, it's just those are all illusions from my point of view. It's not we're all equal. You know, we're all here together. This is our planet. This is our chance. We want to make it. We don't want to make it. You know, but I do feel that that success will come in, in us coming together and surrendering to that rather than one person having power over others. You know, that's always been the, the pattern, you know, and maybe you now in human history. But at this point, it's calling for something different, you know, yeah. or, or and so. If you're listening and, and you agree with that point, you have to ask yourself, how can I get to this different place? And what I'm describing, what we're talking about is a way that it requires you to surrender certain ideas of power and control. I know what that means, the old fashioned ideas of, oh, I'm going to accumulate all this and just hoard it to myself rather than spread it around. So 
or no, I, um, we all need to be in each other's thoughts and, and minds, even if we don't know one another, because from a surrender standpoint, we can feel the collective energies and we can feel our family on the other side of the globe, even if we've never met them. You know, and I, I feel pretty strongly about that and our connection to the earth, because if we surrender, we can sur- we surrender to nature by virtue of the fact that we are nature, we're part of nature, we're part of the earth. You know, there's a little stardust in us, you know, part of the universe. And so one surrender practice that I suggest is looking up at the stars every night. You know, if you can see them, or at least looking up at the sky and just seeing the enormity and the, the magic, you know, that is all around us and how small we are. We're very little, you know, compared to everything. <laughs> So, you know, to keep that in mind, that you're not a big shot, even though you might want to be, you're not really one. Um, Maybe, you know, you can be, but you're not really, not in the grand scheme of things. You're very small. (laughs) And that's fine. You know, that's beautiful. Um, And and you want to be the best you can possibly be while you're here. And to help you surrender, you can keep the perspective of the universe as we have that above us every night with the clear skies or, or the blue skies. You know, a, a, a friend of mine who's a Buddhist just taught me this wonderful practice of, of grounding by imagining the blue sky as a necklace that you wear around, you know, your, your body, that you're wearing the sky on your body, which is a way of connecting to it. Um, and so it's just, I, I feel very strongly in nature. Nature can teach you to surrender. You know, if you look at the flow of water, you know, mm. and you see how it goes around obstacles, it doesn't keep splashing against the same obstacle if there's a way to flow around it. You know, you want to learn to flow around things instead of butting heads. Butting heads is not a good way to be. It doesn't really get you very far except for upset, you right. know, even if you, quote, win. You know, it doesn't, it's not a good way to, to it. You want to be like water and flow around. You know, I uh, read the book, uh, The Art of War by Sun Tin and two, yeah. And he feels, he's, he, he uses Taoism as a principle for, you know, how to deal with conflict. And he looks at war as the greatest failure. That if, if everything else fails, if you can't work with people, um, in other ways, if you have to go to war and be violent, you must be miserable about it. You can't be happy about it. It's a failure. But sometimes it's necessary because that's, you know, from his point of view, you know, it's the only way to, to create change. But you want to try everything else before that. And I really believe that in our human relationships and conflicts, you don't want to go to war with your friends or your enemies. You, you want to try and surrender whatever is keeping you from finding peace. And that takes a lot of self-honesty, you know, to say, all right, what am I holding on to? How am I perpetuating this horrible dynamic here? What little part, let's say you say it's all his fault. You know, that that's the problem. That's what narcissists say. You know, narcissists do have empathy deficient disorder, you know, because they don't have empathy. They, they can't go into therapy because they always, you know, if a couple comes in, it's always, it's her fault. It's his fault. It's never, they can't own any responsibility for anything. So that's why therapy is pretty hard with, I don't know if you found that, but with narcissists, is you can't do it. And so if you're in a, if you are a narcissist, a full-blown narcissist, it's going to be a lot harder because of the way you're wired neurologically. But for, but it's possible. It's, I don't, haven't lost hope for anybody. But if, you, if you're anybody else but a narcissist, you can ask yourself these questions. And it's sometimes like it's painful to give up your ego. It's like, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I want to hold on to it. But that's okay. You can be kind to yourself and say, okay, of course you want to hold on to it. It's the ego. That's what you do. But still, let me try and try to come from another place, even though my ego is going. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, and that war metaphor makes you know, so much sense. Uh, for, well, for me internally, right? Because my initial war was, I'm not going to let myself feel these feelings. Like I was at war against my feelings, right? And and right. that resulted in me being entirely shut down and incapable of in- intimacy and you know, stuck in addictions and all the rest of it. But it was it was when I, 
you know, Lang, I guess, surrendered, right, in that sense, and just said, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to battle this anymore. I'm not going to keep any of these feelings down anymore. I'm going to let them come up. And that, and that was the beginning. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope you know the date of that and you celebrate that date. <laughs> I don't have a very particular develop, but it, but you talk about it in the book, but sometimes when we deal with these deeper seated traumas, you know, the, the, a, a, a guide is needed. And so I think my initi- initi- my, ini- my intuition led me to the right guide who gave me uh, enough support to start to sink into them and, and feel them. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. And, and that, that took courage. But you reached a point of surrender with your emotions when you were on that couch and your head was talking to you. You reached, I can't take this anymore point. And that's sometimes what gets people to surrender, you know, where they get to the point where this isn't working for me, whether it's an addiction. I can't keep drinking. This is mm-hmm. killing me. I can't mm-hmm. do it. I can't keep, you know, engaging in my sexual addiction. This is risking my life. You know, I can't do it. And just I'm in so much pain. You know, please help me, you know, to the higher power. Now, you get to that point of surrender. That's one way of getting there is just reaching this bottom where suddenly you know, many people have spiritual awakenings at that point. You know, throughout history, you just get to the point. I can't take this anymore. This is not working. And you just kind of put this cry out to the universe. And then suddenly things change. You start to meet people like you met your guide or you make decisions or you just, you know, all of a sudden something's changed when you reach that pain bottom. So that's yeah, one way yeah. to get there. It's not the only way to get there for everyone listening to, to, to reach the bottom of surrender. Then after that, you just go up, you know, and you just, I'll do anything to feel better. You know, people with major depression have that or anxiety disorder, which is so painful you know, to have panic attacks, anything, just release me from this, this pain. And um, that's a helpful point, you know, therapeutically, it's a helpful point, because then, okay, let's talk about that. Let's, let's go in that direction, then. Whereas their ego might have been holding on, I'm not giving up alcohol, I don't have a problem. You know, everyone thinks I have a problem. I don't have a problem. <laughs> so, you know, you have, <laughs> each person has to get there on their own. But once they do, if I have a patient or I know somebody who's gotten to that point, that's the intervention point. You know, the door is open then. That's when you can help them. But before that, the door is shut. You know, no, I'm not going to rehab. I'm not going to go help. I, I'm not going to get help. So you have all that resistance. But when somebody is surrendered because of the extreme pain they've been in, Oh, that's a plus. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you say that, and I suppose there is one, because there was, a, just as you speak, there was a surrender before the surrender, because my first surrender was with the alcohol. I was like, okay, I quit. I'm going to go to AA. And like, that was like, I suppose my first surrender to be like, okay, I can't, you know, I can't control my drink. You know, I'm, I've just given up, like trying to do this by myself and control my drink. I'm going to go get help. Right. And then that gave me, yeah, a space to kind of hold me until I, till till the next phase, I suppose was, and then was to start surrendering yeah. to my feelings because I'd sit in these meetings and people would be like, "How do you feel?" And I'd be like, "Fine, fine, fine." And I just recognised after a while that I was totally incapable of articulating a feeling or feeling a feeling, and yeah, right. and then it yeah. became a need to 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 get into the emotional work. Yes, yes. But the emotions, sometimes people don't like getting into their emotions because, you know, they're, they're painful. You know, when I talk about empathy, they're, they're, you, people can have cognitive empathy where they feel something with their mind. You know, I'm so sorry you're going through this. But then emotional empathy, the emotions are a bit harder because it means you have to start coming in your body and out of your head and begin to feel you know, the pain or the old traumas or the emotional triggers, it's a whole universe of of energy in your body, you know, with emotional energy, physical energy. And some people would prefer to avoid it, honestly, and and some people get away with avoiding it. Um, But but those who have reached a surrender point, you know, part of it is accepting your whole self and exploring the universe of your whole self, which is miraculous. It's painful. But people have a hard time surrendering to discomfort. 
You know, they feel discomfort and they want to bounce out of it immediately. You know, as opposed to being able to tolerate a little discomfort in service to your own growth. Yeah. You know, that's to be able to, to sit with unresolved problems for a while. Let's say you, you and your spouse are having a conflict and it's not resolved immediately. That's okay. You know, it doesn't have to be resolved. You can sit with it, but that's a surrender and saying, all right, I'm not going to push it. I'm going to back off for a while. I'm going to just let, you know, the, the, mad, the cosmic winks come in and the synchronicities and more information so I can be clearer when I, you know, and I really have the information I need to get through. You want to, you want to get through to people. You don't want to just be right. You want to yeah. communicate. The communication is two ways. And, and um, you know, I just want to say people, everybody's annoying. I'm annoying. You're annoying, irritating everybody, everybody. So try not to be so hard on people. You know, it, it's just at times, that's just how we are. So you know, that's one thing to keep in mind when you want to, you know, love others and accept others and surrender to the love of people and relationships. And that's where the real joy comes. You know, I mean, also their career successes and, and all of that, but the love is what will truly sustain you. Yeah. And that idea and something that I've been growing into a lot more recently is that you know, I notice that when I perceive others, I can get very fixated on their physicality, like how attractive are they? You know, what, you know, I, I look at their, literally like look at their body and like observe and judge their body. And then I might observe and judge their behaviors, right? If I'm going slightly deeper beyond that, but there's something beyond that. And when I can do it, I notice such a shift, which is like, can I see the light in them? Like you spoke about Namaste, right? Can I, can I see the Tao, let's say? flowing through them and and then i'm in a different world of relation to them right then then i can see past the annoyances and the judgments and, and all the rest of it absolutely well the judgments are something we all deal with you know being judgmental is a human trait and so you want to just notice that as you did um and we have judgmental people if somebody judges you you know it's less than you could only imagine what they're doing in their own heads. I mean, they're much worse on themselves. I mean, it's not justifying what they did to you, but what's going on in their heads is really mayhem, you know, and painful. Um, but I, I want to say about the physical appearance, you know, what you were talking about, you were judging people by their physical appearance, whether you deem them attractive or not. It's very interesting because you can be around the so-called attractive person who looks good, but their energy is no good. You know, you just feel like you're drained, you feel, you know, put off. And so you, you have to surrender to your intuition when you're around people, reading their vibe, reading their energy, in addition to their physical appearance. As so you can get a beautiful physical specimen who's horrible for you, mm -hmm. you know. So you want to have somebody you're harmonious with. And on I, an yeah, and, and th that's right. And I wasn't even thinking about that necessarily in a romantic context. I was just thinking yeah. about it in a, just a, a general sort of observing and, and what, what runs in my head, right? You know, this, this beyond the, a sort of a, even a sexual or romantic context. It's just, yes. uh, you know, <laughs> I, I just noticed that's my pattern. And, and, and definitely my work right now is to kind of look behind that and like, what's the light, you know, that's lights them that's also lighting me and that sense of connectedness. In everybody. You know, you can yeah. judge somebody as this or that, but still see the light in them mm. and just laugh at yourself. Be light. You know, yeah, I'm judging them again. Here I am judging people again. And uh, OK, I could you know, ask that to lift so I can see beyond the judgment. The judgment doesn't let you get very far, but it's very human. We all do it. And it's OK. You know, it's all OK. You're not a bad person for doing it. And we all do it. And. You just have to be aware of it. If you're aware of it, then you can choose not to keep going in that direction and to go in another direction. We're surrendering to seeing the divinity in everybody, seeing the light in everyone, even if you don't like them. That's when you yeah. say namaste, it's I respect the spirit within you. It isn't that I like you necessarily. And see, this whole thing about liking someone is very overrated in a certain sense. You know, you, you can like or dislike people according to your own temperament. 
um, but you can still respect people. And if you could only, you know, surrender to that idea, I just said, it's a big idea. And it's hard to wrap the mind around necessarily. The mind thinks I don't like somebody. Why should I respect them? Why do I, you know, have to, you know, let's say they're a despicable person. Do I still want to respect them? You know, from, from my point of view, you do. You know, you don't have to like them. You don't have to do a business deal with them, but they're a human being. Just on a basic, basic, basic level, acknowledging that frees you from holding on to resentments and judgments. And the, what I'm interested in is you being free and me being free. But if you hold on, if your ego holds on to a resentment, I'm judging this person for doing this bad deed. You could hold on to the judgment and it will eat you, eat at you. I can guarantee you that the resentments stick on you like barnacles and they're kind of parasitic and they eat over time. You still have them and then you build them up and you don't want them. You want to be free and clear. You want to move around without all these resentments, but the ego likes the resentments. So keep that in mind. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you see that with people who are on this path, they almost get, they get brighter as they get older. It seems like because they're yeah. shedding their barnacles, right? Like, and yeah. so they've actually got less of that when they're 80 than when they had when they were 20. And you can see that in them. Uh, but, but, the, but the reverse is more usual that actually people load up those resentments over time and they just, yeah, and, and you can see that in their physicality. That's why it's important to surrender to aging and Oh, surrender the resentments and everything you carry around with you so that as you age, you go lighter and brighter and more attractive as you age. When you see people who've carried around a lot of resentments and they get older and older, they get bitter, their faces are you know, drawn in a certain way, they don't have an openness, they've lost their innocence. Um, they're just bogged down by all the stuff they're carrying around. And I I wouldn't suggest that as a way to go, you know, but, you know, surrendering the ego, that seems to be a theme in our in our talk, you know, surrendering the ego at times when it's appropriate is helpful to you. It's not always surrendering the ego. You can fly with your ego to make things happen and all that because it has wonderful uh, roles as long as you know what those wonderful roles are and you don't let the dark side of the ego take you over. Yeah, it's almost like it, it's almost like as you speak, I imagine it as as like a dance, and that's part of the intuit, intuition, right? Developing the intuition is right. to know, okay, when am I consciously going to allow my ego to run, and then when am I going to surrender again? And, and it, it feels like that's like yes, a dance, dance yes. with the ego almost. Yes, and part of the surrender is having that witness state that you were just talking about, watching. What, what's going on? Hmm, my ego's involved again. Hmm, I really want to get back at this person. I want revenge. You know, and you have to let yourself feel that, but then you have to say, no, 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 no. Let's come from another place. So it's a, an inner dialogue that you, you develop where you're very compassionate with yourself. You're not down on yourself when you, you know, notice the very base feelings. Everybody has base feelings. I want to get back at them. I feel so hurt. You know, whatever, whatever revenge or resentment or anger, whatever you want to hold on to, you know, be suspect of that because not because of the other person so much, but because of you, you don't want to be that person with all the barnacles as time goes on. You want to be a free, open spirit that's not weighed down. And I guarantee you the things we're talking about can weigh you down in a big way and have physical and emotional effects on you. You don't want that. You want to be able to let go of things. You know, let's say somebody hurt you. Let's say somebody really hurt you. Of course they did, you know, and I'm not justifying why I'm so sorry you were hurt. You know, I'm so sorry. You know, we all get hurt and I'm so sorry you were hurt. And you can move on from that, you know, is to, to stay in that, those waters of hurt for years and years and years and years is um, not good for you. You know, yeah, that's where the surrender comes in. I was hurt and I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to keep my heart open and I'm going to love and I'm not going to let that hurt shut me down. 
you know, yeah. that's one of the lessons. Yeah, I'm going to hurt. And, and and often people, I think what I notice in, in myself is I, I can stay in a story about the pain as opposed to actually feeling the pain and just letting the tears roll. Um, you know, I think you, what, what's the expression in the book that I love? Um, let go to the healing of tears, right? That's what you talk about. Um, yeah, and that, that's, that's kind of been my mantra, I suppose, for the last decade or so. Uh, and now what I'm finding increasingly is I can let go to other aspects of my being. Yeah. But um, right, right, exactly that you do have other aspects of your being, you see the the delusion that many people have or misbelief that uh, many people have is that's all of who you are. You mm-hmm. know, the thing, the negative voices, the the ego, the mind that that's all of who you are. And I can guarantee you that's not so. That is not so. If you can just put one foot, you know, in the water here of what we're talking about and begin to feel something larger in yourself, your heart, your intuition, um, maybe getting help from the forces around you, see what that's like before you write it off and say, "Mm, you know, just see what it's like. See if it helps you. You know, the, the whole point is to help you and it's to make your life better. And it's to take the burden off of you and to bring a lightness of being instead of a, a heaviness or a bitterness or, you know, people walk around saying the world's a terrible place. It will never change, you know, where people give up hope because of all the suffering and the, the pain in the world. And that's where this can this surrender can really serve you, because if you're clear about your values. And you believe in goodness, you believe in in humanity, you believe in giving, you believe in loving, you stay true to that. That's you want to surrender to positive values as well and not let the you know, the others get you down because the they'll pull you and they'll want to get you down. And there's always that you know pull and that battle of light and dark. I mean, so many films are about that. But you have the power not to go down. And if you do go down. We all go down, you pick yourself up again and you go up. But, you know, part of this is surrendering to, um, you know, having a community too, you know, or having at least one friend that you can be honest with and who can help bring you up when you go down. Because it's, it's part of the surrender process is you surrender, but then you go backwards and you take it back again. You know, there's that resentment towards my ex again, or there's my resentment towards my competitor again. There it is. That's fine. There it is again. Fine. Old friend. It's an old friend. Um, But sometimes when you can't lift yourself back up, the community can. They can look at you and go, you know, remember yourself. I love you. Here, let me make you a meal. It's okay, you know, to do something nurturing for you um, so that you begin to feel better again. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's also something that I've, because I guess I've been in the privileged position of basically being able to pay for that, right? I've been able to pay for therapists to right, serve that right. role. And I right. really haven't got that if I think about it in terms of, you know, close friendships, particularly in my life or community in my life. And that is something I'm also becoming aware of that that that's part of, of this is building, you know, community and, uh, yeah, and finding finding those authentic relationships where I can be completely open about my emotions. I mean, I'm starting to find some actually, as I said that I just reflect on it. But it's it's uh, yeah, it's certainly part of the process, isn't it? That um, it is. That's one of the chapters in the book is surrendering to um, friends and soulmates and anamkara, which are the soul friends, the people that you really feel a communion with, um, you know, that you can talk to, that you can trust. You know, and really finding these people who where we can support each other through through this life. You know, it's important. It's hard. This life is full of challenges. So you want to have as much support as possible that you could trust. The trust is important. And that's where surrender comes in. But I, I believe that people have to earn your trust. It's not just something you turn over to somebody. You have to watch their behavior and see how they are over a period of time to see if they're trustworthy. As people can say all kinds of things, you know, but, you know, if people show up for you, you know, if you're upset, you know, and they bring you a cup of soup, you know, say here, or let's have a cookie, you know, or something, you know, let's go for a walk together. Let me hear you out. You know, that's nice. 
You know, that makes you feel appreciated and wanted. And the, the simple things are the nicest things to me. I mean, every simple, everyday goodnesses that, that happen, you know, those are exciting to me. You know, really exciting. They're truly nurturing, you know, as opposed to the big business deal or, you know, which are the peak moments, which are exciting in a different way. You know, but but what will sustain you every day are the little things are the people around you who smile at you, you know, or bring you flowers or you know, say, what do you what do you think about this, Richard? You know, I really want your input yeah. you know, or whatever. Someone who values your opinions. Yeah. And what I'm hearing as you say that it's 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 like it's like a tenderness, right, that you, you're, yeah. you're you've cultivated, you are cultivating that allows you to be touched and delighted by these simple things. Uh, and yeah, when I relate that to myself, it, it, you know, that my, my ego still wants the big, the big moment. And I can see there's a surrender in that, right? Surrender in finding joy in yeah, little gestures, little acts of kindness that I might do or some I might receive. It's true, but you can have both, Richard. You can have the big moments and you can have the little moments. You can have it all. But when you don't have the big moments, not to be too upset, because you have all these beautiful bursts of light in the little moments. And for me, that's what's sustaining. I, you know, the big moments happen from time to time and successes do accumulate, you know, which is very gratifying, you know, when that happens. Um, but every day, the daily life, what you have, you know, are the little moments, supposedly little moments. Yeah, but that's right, supposedly, because that's it, it's like. Yeah, there's this expression, I like, you know, pain is pain. That was something I had to kind of work with a lot in the early days because, you know, here I am, this like privileged middle class guy with a career and money and blah, blah, blah. And who am I to like have pain about this aspect or that aspect of my childhood when, you know, somebody else experienced X, Y? And I like one of the like early mantras was, right, pain is pain, is pain, is pain, is pain. If I'm feeling pain, it's pain, right? And it, it's my pain and it doesn't really matter if, it's different to somebody else's or it's a different, whatever. But there's also this sense of like, joy is joy. Like if somebody gives me a cookie, that's joyful. It's joyful. If I've done, you know, a billion dollar business deal, that's joyful too, but it's joy is joy, right? We don't, we can sort of get out of that idea that of, I need to sort of compare levels of joy or something, right? Exactly. And it's to find joy wherever you can. And to find fun wherever you can, because oftentimes people lose their sense of fun in life and everything becomes very overly serious and that's natural that tendency because things are can be heavy but you want to maintain that childlike awareness in yourself and the appreciation of the you know just the sunlight or just walking down the street i'm walking i'm mobile i can walk you know i have elderly friends now who can't take baths anymore because they can't lift themselves up you know, and taking a bath for me is a great joy of surrender is getting into that water and <laughs> relaxing, you know, letting it all go. Water can help you do that if you like swimming or you like going to the ocean or you like bathtubs or showers. It's a place to let it all go and surrender. You know, and my friend can't do that anymore. And she used to love bath. So, you know, things change. And so you want to be grateful for every little thing you have and be happy about it. Be happy for what you've been given, whether it's the big business deal or the, the little cookie, you know, ha be happy about it all because you deserve that. A lot of people don't know how to be happy because they keep looking for the big things. You know, when's the next big thing going to happen? And, you know, that you're kind of missing out on all the moments in between that because there's happiness there too. Yeah. And that can be on the other. And that's certainly been my experience that that ability to feel joy has been on the other side of all the tra trauma release work. It's right. Yes. That's that's bit. And 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 the meditation. Right. And this is something I've only really got yeah. into recently. You know, meditation has been a great way of kind of consolidating and amplifying that is because, you know, it, frequently during meditation, I'll have those moments of joy. Uh Right, but you it's, allow it's like, yourself. It, like increases my chances of having a joyful moment if I, you know, if I stick if I stick with the meditation. That's nice. Yeah. That that's really nice because it's a lot of people are more used to pain than joy, and so they're used to surrendering to pain or at least feeling pain. But if you have joy to allow yourself to take it in, 
and not just go on to the next thing, but to, whoo, you know, like you're taking in sunlight, you're taking in joy, and that will feed you and it will rejuvenate the body and it will help your endorphins flow, the natural painkillers in the body, the feel good hormones. You, you want to do activities that increase that, such as meditation or laughter or exercise or going out in nature. Um, you want to do all those things to um, regulate your biochemicals so that you don't have stress hormones rushing through your system that increase your blood pressure, decrease your immunity, increase aging, and just general anxiety. You don't want that going on all the time. You want to learn how to shift into the vagal way, the vagus nerve, which is the parasympathetic nervous system that relaxes you. And you can do that through your shifts that you make. You know, that you, you say, I'm going to feel happiness now. I'm going to do something that makes me happy in the simplest of ways. It's not complex. I don't have to gather or anything together to do it. I could go for a walk and be happy. You know, you want to be able to do that. You know, it might, I don't, don't know if it seems unimportant to somebody who's listening, but it's extremely important. You know, these simple things are a way of getting yourself back together and a way of being with you. I know it's hard for people to surrender to themselves, you know, to be able to realize that you, your primary relationship is with yourself. And it needs to be good, as good as it can be. You can't keep beating. You can't keep, you know, running from yourself. You can't keep running from your power. Part of, you know, surrendering is owning your power. And I don't just mean in an external sense. I do mean external is fine. I'm not against external accomplishments. I think they're fantastic. But if that's all you have, it's not going to make you happy. You need to have the inner aligned with the outer, and then you can experience happiness with all the external accomplishments. I mean, I've had people who, you know, patients who've had everything, and then they go to this beautiful vacation. The couple goes to the vacation in Fiji, and they argue the whole time. You know, they're in this gorgeous environment, and they're arguing the whole time. No, that's not right. You know, they want to be able to have a good vacation. You know, you want to be able to be happy wherever you are, not just when you're doing a business deal. Because the problem with that is if you make your identity just that person, that's not going to make you happy because that will change. Life ebbs and flows. That will change. You won't keep being in that position forever. And you want to be a bigger more nuanced person than that, you know, yeah, and you exactly. are. It reminds me of your quote in the book from what women, I have big, I contain multitudes, right? That's right. I contain multitudes. Walt Whitman, I contain multi- multitudes. And that, that, I think, is the message of surrender, is that we contain multitudes. We're not just one thing or another. So you don't have to worry about losing so much. People are very afraid of losing things, you know, but you don't have to be afraid of that. You can keep building on yourself. You can, I mean, just if you have any doubt, just go do a, an act, an anonymous act of giving. You know, that can boost you as much as it will boost anybody else. You know, it's, it's a way for you to build up your positive energy. You know, if, if in doubt, go do something nice for somebody else. And even if you don't want to, it will make you feel better and make them feel better. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Um, something, yeah, something that just came to mind there as you're speaking, you, you kind of close out the, the book with um, death, <laughs> right? Death. <laughs> so should we talk about death? And I suppose there's, there's this notion of surrendering to, to the inevitability of death. Right. Yeah, it's inevitable. <laughs> It's the appointment we will all keep. <laughs> People don't like to think about it, though. And it's well, not necessary to think about it a lot, but it is the ultimate surrender. You know, if you really want to examine your life from beginning to end, birth is the first surrender where you embody and you're here in, in life. And then you go through life and you have your relationships and have your experiences and then you depart. And so you go and, and, um, you, you have to. There's nobody going to get out of it. <laughs> so, 
to me, it's an acceptance of the life cycles, which gives you a truer sense of, of meaning. Um, and certainly I've learned so much from people who are on the deathbed. I, I've you know, worked in hospices and I've worked with dying patients where I've been there with them. I was there with my parents when each of them passed over. And so I've had experience with that transition. And um, it's a beautiful thing if you have elderly parents to be with them during this transition and to be a, a, a shining light instead of somebody afraid, you know, or fighting. A lot of people fight over the death, but a lot of families fight over possessions. It's really gruesome to watch, but it happens. You know, they fight for possessions, the house, the money, the bank accounts. They're, the poor person is saying they're dying and they're arguing with each other. I've seen that at the deathbed, too. But if you have a chance to help your parents or to help somebody, I would take it as a sacred opportunity. If you can be there without fear in your eyes, you know, you want to just be a shining light to help somebody over. And hopefully when I go, there's somebody nice to hold my hand and help me over and make it simple and happy. And there you go. You know, bye bye. And it depends what your belief is. You know, at the end of the power of surrender, I, I talk about afterlife and that so varies with so many people's beliefs, you know, but again, if you believe in the power of goodness and love, and you really in, in your lifetime begin to feel the truth of that, because there's a lot of truth in that. Um, it's not something that ends here. It's something that's greater than this life. And you have to have to know that. Um, you know, my personal belief is that we don't die and that the spirit lives on and that we just go on to a different stage of learning because we're in the development of our spirit. And, and my, my teacher, who's a Taoist, you know, just says the work continues, you know, stop working. <laughs> you just the work on the soul continues. But you, you have everybody has to decide what they believe. And if you're an atheist, that's fine, too. You don't know, just be who you are and be happy with it. You know, I'm not interested necessarily in in you changing but if if people listen and this is what i'd like them to be open to with this conversation if 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 you listen and something resonates even though your mind might say mm, that's not what i believe in but something is resonating then there is something there for you that you yeah. need to follow and i hope you do follow it and this dichotomy of mind and and heart and intuition that we've we've mentioned, you know, numerous times in, in our dialogue is something I think that's up for, for you, you know, for everyone. And it, it's worth looking at it. You don't have to look at it this way, but if it resonates, if you notice something in you going, I'm interested in this, I like to pursue it more. Um, the practice of surrender will be helpful for you. Yeah. I think that's such a good message and that trusting that, that little vibe, that little resonance. I mean, I think about, you know, wild animals how do they know which plants are nutritious and which are poisonous well there's a resonance they have a you know they have a sense you know that this is this is the right path and we have that we're animals and we have that and we can tune into it and i'm so grateful i followed that path because there were certain you know therapists and uh I, you know, I worked with a clinic in Venice, which is where you are right now, right? Um, the, the primal oh. set, uh, the primal therapy center in, in Venice. And right, I looked on that and I looked on Wikipedia and it's like, you know, pseudoscience and it's woo woo and you shouldn't do, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and you have to like just tune out of all of those, you know, external opinions and be like, no, this is my, my <laughs> heart says I need to go get on a plane to LA and spend like three months, you know, being pushed cushions and crying and that was what i needed to do but it it was yeah it was that it all started with like just tuning in to that yeah, yeah that is that resonance. on abbott was that on abbott kinney uh no do you remember no it's not on abbott kinney it's uh it's just between santa monica and venice uh, okay yeah it's um yeah the primal primal center yeah um but yeah, anyhow, the point is that it, it's like I just trusted it. Like there's no, there was no like logical reason for me to get on a plane to go visit this center set up by if I'd have just taken what I'd read on the internet by, you know, some wacko from the 70s, right? That right. It, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> there was no way my intellect would have let me do that. 
Right. I guess that's the point I'm making, yeah. Right. Well, well, you look at, you know, history and so many of the great innovations and, and uh, inventions have come through intuition. Um, you know, Paul McCartney, you know, talks about his uh, lyrics coming through in dreams. And, um, you know, the, the sewing machine, the, the vision for the needle and the sewing machine came through in a dream as well. And so people have listened to their intuition. Conrad Hilton talked about Connie's intuitions, his hunches that he used to have when he made business deals. You know, so it's I think all the really exceptional business people and creatives have listened to their intuition. You know, I interviewed Quincy Jones for my book, Positive Energy, and he's one of my heroes. I just love him. I just love, creatively. He's such an icon to me. And he says he doesn't do anything without the goosebumps. If he doesn't get the goosebumps, he says there's no point in doing anything. There's nothing there for him. So, you know, it's true. I, I believe the same thing. If you don't get a resonance, if you don't get a yes, this is going to be a positive thing for me and the other person. I wouldn't do it. I mean, certainly don't force anything, you know, don't force anything because it sounds right. You know, I in my life, when I've done that or when the ego gets in the way and it wants something, it wants a relationship, it wants this, this path, it wants this, it wants that, you know, if you but if you listen to your intuition and it says, hmm, that's not really going to be good for you, but I want it anyways. So then you go forward with it. And then you learn from that too. As I said earlier, I see everything as a lesson. You learn from that too. You learn, okay, I didn't listen and that didn't turn out so well. So what I found in my life, and I don't, I don't know about you, Richard, but when I listen to my intuition and I balance it with reason, that's when things turn out really well. When I try and force things and my intuition is saying no, then not so good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I don't, I suppose I don't, that's a good, a good thought that I don't, I don't think I necessarily, maybe there's something that's worth to, sort of meditating on is like that balance between the intellect and the, and the intuition. I think I tend to be like, either I'm all in on intellect or I'm all in on intuition. I'm not sure. oh. I think there's something to be said for like, like consciously being aware of, okay, am I listening to my intu intuition now? Am I working with my intellect? Like almost like, imagining them as two advisors that I might like seek counsel from, like that's not something I consciously yeah. engage in, but that's an interesting thought. Yeah. That's the inner dialogue is say, what does my mind say about it? What does my heart say about it? Can they work together? No, mm. I, I had a, a, a book cover um, for my empath survival guide in France. And they had a picture of the mind holding the heart on the cover. And then that was the holding hands with the heart. And I love that <laughs> because that's, that's everything I, I believe it is that the mind and the heart can work together. You know, it's not either or. And I know in my medical training, it was either or. That's how I was, I was taught. You either have to be intellectual and academic and go by the book or, you know, or nothing really. But, um, you know, my path in medicine and healing in my life has been integrating intuition with the intellect. Right. I mean, I like that. And another another way I've heard it framed is that the, the 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 thought is the is the masculine and the heart is the feminine, right? Or or the conscious is the masculine and the subconscious is the feminine. I, so the way you you've just framed it there has me think about like we could consider it as a marriage of of of, of masculine and feminine energy, like within more masculine and feminine intelligence within you know within ourselves. That too. <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's all about integration. I mean, that's what I love about this conversation. It's not either or. You can be everything. It's about using all your assets and all your gifts together. The mask, everybody has a masculine and feminine too. They have a light and dark. There's a yin and the yin and the yang symbol. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're both. We're so much. We have dichotomies within us. We're not just one thing. We're both. We have the feminine. We have the masculine. We have the dark. We have the light. I mean, that's what makes human beings so dynamic. But the point of surrender and the point of discernment is to make a choice of where we come from and not let it rule us. That's where people fall as they let forces within them that are unruly come in and take over. 
And you, you don't want to do that. You want to be empowered. Empowerment is my definition of it is being able to, to choose where you come from. And if you come from a place that's not so good to be able to retract it and to go backwards and make an amends and say, hmm, I went the wrong direction here. I'm so sorry. I hurt you, you know, and, and come back. You can always reel it back in. But the, the key is awareness of, um, you know, not like it's not oppressive, but it's like a beautiful way of being aware of yourself. So you're not necessarily involved in anything. You're more of a witness state, you know, about your your different parts of yourself and how they interact. You know, that's 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 part of maintaining objectivity, too, is being able to witness yourself and to know certain principles of how of what we carry, the dichotomy, the light, the dark, the masculine, the feminine. We have all that. If you can accept that, then you can work with it. So you, yeah. I, I think what's so important about this conversation is we're defining things in verbal terms so people can get a conception of the forces that are within them in yeah. all of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what, yeah, what I get there is like this, I love your definition of empowerment. We can choose who, we, who we're going to be in the moment. And that's something I'm, I'm coming in Chrissy aware of. Like mood is everything. Like attitude, mood, state is, is everything. And if I can be aware of the state I'm in. And I, even today, I can remember it like I, I was, you know, I, I started early today. One of my kids got up in the middle of the night. It was a bit underslept. I, you know, in the middle of the day, he had a big sort of chunk of childcare and you had to kind of get back to the office to do this podcast. And so, you know, and, I'm, and I could see myself like getting tense with the kids and, and like, but I'm really aware is like, okay, what the hell can I do to shift my state now? Like, you know, what? And I'm just like, okay, well, how, how can I like get sick? And then I, I started to put music on and then I started to, you know, feel some fun. And then one of my kids started dancing and I'm like, okay, let's dance. And like, I start dancing with my kid. And then, you know, within like a few minutes, I'd managed to change my state. And that was just everything. Right. Exactly. But then you asked yourself the question, how can I shift the state? Mm. You no, know, rather than surrendering to chaos and despair and stress, you don't want to surrender to stress. Whatever you do, that's not a good surrender. You want to be able to shift out of stress with an alternate activity or alternate mm. behavior. Mm. But you want to recognize stress. People are generally very stressed out, you know, and in the in the US, certainly they're just running around in LA. My God, you know, it's a high stress situation, you know, that they put themselves in. So um, you don't have to be that way. You know, you can make choices and that's what surrender is. What do I want to surrender to? Do I want to be stressed out and high tension all the time or do I want to have more fun? You know, do I want to be focused and clear when I'm in a, a business situation or some a medical situation? Do I want to be focused and clear? Yes. Do you want to be stressed out? No, you don't want to feed. The stress hormones, you want to feed the endorphins and your mind can affect your body's neurochemicals. So just know that, that, that you can make a choice to get those endorphins flowing when you don't want the stress hormones ravaging your system all the time. And people walk around frequently with chronic stress hormones ravaging their system. And it's a miserable state to be in. You know, they're irritable, they're mean, you know, they cut you off in traffic. You know, it's just, <laughs> it comes out in all kinds of ways and it's not good for the body, mind, and soul. So in, in the spirit that we're talking in surrender, you can make a choice. I'm stressed out now. I feel these stress hormones flowing through my system and I don't like it. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to relax my body. I'm going to think about something really positive or I'm going to go out in nature. I'm going to calm myself down and self-soothe myself instead of keep feeding the stress hormones. And so you can make that conscious shift inside yourself. And you see, that's empowerment too, being able to have this inner dialogue and surrendering, making a choice about what you surrender to in yourself. Do you want to surrender to the endorphins, which you can create? You have the power to create endorphins, the feel-good natural painkiller neurochemicals. I mean, think about it. Mm. You can generate though. They feel good. And versus the stress hormones, you definitely have the power to generate those too. 
but just know that your mind is generating them, <laughs> that you're the one. It's not just happening to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and I think that goes back to your definition of, of empowerment, which I love. Um, and talking about stress hormones, I've just got a text through from uh, my partner saying, you know, where are you? Kids, kids, oh, no. kids are wanting to go to bed. <laughs> so, um, yeah. To, to have some compassion and tune into where she's at. I, yeah, I, we should, um, you know, I should I'd probably bring this to a close, but it's, it's been wonderful. You know, thank you so much, Judith. I've really enjoyed it. And it feels like we've um, had the grand tour of, um, of, of the book, the, the power of surrender. We've, we've dived into a lot of the different ways in which we can surrender. Uh, yes. I, I've enjoyed the conversation a lot. Great. Any any kind of closing message for people? Obviously, we'll put the link to, to the book. Uh, we'll put a link to your to your website, drjudithorloff.com. Uh, yeah, any, anything else you'd like to say in closing? Um, just that the, the book and the audio um, is on Amazon and on my website, drjudithorloff.com. I have an online course for surrendering. If you'd like to take that, it's with Hay House. It's on my um, website. And um, I just encourage everybody, you know, who's listened to this to try it right away. Just find something immediately. Don't wait. Don't wait for life to intervene. You know, find something to surrender to right now. You know, what can you surrender? Maybe it's a negative thought. You know, maybe you can breathe. Maybe you can listen to your intuition. But surrender to something at once and experience it directly. Okay. Touche, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, really welcome. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.